And so what then makes for a good night for Labour here? Oh, look, obviously a good night for Labour would be if, if we're in a position to form a government. Sure. Um, and that's, that's clearly what we're looking at. From a, from, a, from a party vote standpoint, I'd like to see us get towards 30%. I think that... Um, you know, that would be a good effort from us considering where we started the campaign. Yep. Uh, and, and hopefully some of the turnout strategy work that we've had today will see that come in as, as the night goes on. Mm. Do you think the campaign was too short? Yes. Yep. <laughs> um, and, and I really do think that, uh, particularly for us, and this is maybe something that, that people can look at from a strategy point of view, but we had a lot of policy. Yeah. You know, we had a lot of big, bold, yes. different moves. And getting them all out and into the public consciousness mm. in a month yep. was really hard. And there was a judgment call to be made about could more of it have been rolled out before the rugby, but to be honest, it would have been completely swamped yeah. and forgotten about during the rugby. You know, I mean, I had the example of, of talking to some people just last week about our policy about converting uh, the doll for 18 and 19 year olds into subsidies for apprenticeships. You know, fantastic policies. People were really excited about mm. it. First, they'd heard of it. Right. So, yeah. Right. And then, of course, there was a week lost to the tea tapes in the middle of it all. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that was a distraction for us. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt that it, it, at a period in which we had been getting some good traction mm. around policy, it was lost. We launched our children's policy mm. around that period, too, which I still think is a really good policy as well, and one that a lot of people, um, I think, would, you know, would have seen as a reason to vote for us. So, yeah, absolutely massive distraction. Uh, uh, although, as we just discussed at the start, clearly played into Winston's hands. Yes, well, I think that does seem undeniable. Very odd, though, I mean, Winston Peters started by basically lambasting the media for the way in which they got the tape, yet managed to end it as the media's defender and the uh, principal attacker of the uh, pr protagonists. Do you think he was given a free ride on that flip-flop? <laughs> um, oh, possibly. I mean, that's Winston, though. He, mm. he, he's black is white and white is black on a regular occasion, occasions with Winston. I, I think, you know, the fact was he was a subject of the, of the tape. Right. You know, he was a subject of the discussion in the tape and that automatically drew him in right. to it. And that was all the opening that he needed. And yeah, look, he was, he was prepared to play both sides with the media on this, but they were interested. I mean, there's no story that the, that the mainstream media like better than one about themselves. <laughs> and, and, and that's what this became, extraordinarily. I mean, I still believe the behaviour of the Prime Minister and referral to the police and so on was just absolutely bizarre mm. and, and totally disproportionate to the situation. Right, right. Well, Grant, I know that you've uh, got other media commitments, the, the uh, television crews want you and so on, so uh, we'll let you go now. We'll just thank you for coming in and uh, having your chat to us about how you see things. Oh, but any final uh, prediction? Any final prediction for the night? I do think we'll come up a bit from where we are now. And so, yep, people should keep watching. You never know what will happen. Right. Well, thank you once again. We Thanks appreciate your time. Thanks. See you. No Cheers. Bye-bye. OK, well, Interesting. he did sound a wee bit downbeat. Yeah, well, I mean, I think he's looking at those numbers and he's seeing that there hasn't been a huge swing yet against National. Yeah. And really, for Labour to be in with a chance of forming the next government, I do think National has to come down to 45, 46%. Yeah. Um, and Labour, you know, their Labour vote, it's holding around the middish highest 20s, but yeah. as he said, you know, they really need to get up to 30% for this to be anything other than, I think, a bad night That's for them. That's right. Yeah. And for someone like Grant Robertson, he's probably pretty tired after be being knackered. campaign Absolutely spokesperson knackered. and Wellington Central yeah. incumbent. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, um, they'll all be exhausted. I mean, exa I'm exhausted. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> and I'm not even in the election. Well, yeah, we've seen it with John Key, I think, in the last, you know, that last debate. He did look like he wanted to be somewhere else. Um, Phil well, Goff, wasn't that interesting? It was. Um, I, I've talked to a number of people about that and mm. talked about his body language, because often he was like this and he was looking down a lot yeah. and looking mm. like he, he, it was all a bit beneath him, perhaps. Yep. Um, but well, I wondered if that was kind of deliberate, because he was trying to be prime ministerial, mm. and here was Phil Goff, mm. who was being very oppositional, yes, kind quite. of hectoring him yes. almost, and maybe that was quite deliberate to say, well, you know, I'm doing my own thing. Yes, possibly. I mean, it's, it's hard to know, I mean, because we always try to read in uh, everything, you know, we always assume this a point to everything, because that's the nature of the game we're in. We sometimes lose sight just of the human factor, and you know, these people are human beings with limits. And um, I mean, you saw the classic thing with Rick Perry in that, 
no, I'm forgetting that uh, Republican debate where oh, yeah. he had to lay out his three things that he had to get out there, and he just forgot what the third one was. Sure. You know, he just he just forgot. Yeah. And so these things do happen. They're human beings, and at some point they they do make. Uh, fallible errors. But the other interesting thing I thought, um, Grant, you said they're not giving it away yet, they're not, mm. but they're obviously that swing to Winston, yes. I think has caught them, them by surprise as yeah. well. Mm. Uh, and that's the big um, interest point of the night so far, isn't it? Um, Pretty much is. We're seeing New Zealand first on 6.67%. Mm -hmm. um, that's certainly higher than I would have expected. Mm -hmm. uh, my prediction at the start of the night was 5.5 .5 for New right. Zealand first. Um, I'm not sure how that figure is likely to change once we go into the urban sure. booths. What, what's your feeling? Well, I mean, it is difficult to know whether, though you'd have to wonder who this large swag of um, disenfranchised rural voters are who've chosen to cast their vote for Winston instead. So, and as Grant said, you know, they started off below 5% uh, last election and stay down there. This time they've started off around seven yep. and you know, they're staying around there. So these things are starting to, um, starting to trend that way. Now let's have a look at um, Epsom. Mm -hmm. um, there's some suggestion that Banks is in trouble. We're looking at the results here and it doesn't quite look that way to me. Um, he's got 2,000, over 2,000 mm -hmm. of the vote. But 6.4%. Um, yeah, we've still got a long way to go, sure. I guess, before we can be sure about that one. Yeah, um, yeah. Overall, what do you think is happening in terms of nationals' likelihood to be able to govern, given that it looks like there'll be some sort of overhang? It does look like there'll be an overhang, I and mean, I think we do have to see what's going to happen to the Māori Party, um, mm. uh, uh, party vote share, and as Grant was saying, what happens in Te Tautonga. Yeah. I think so, that really is the swing Māori uh, seat, that's the one that's yeah. most uh, you know, up in the air. Um, I see that ACT, they're now predicting still to only have one, um, one person, one, uh, yep. one uh, MP in Parliament. Okay, oh, it looks like we might have a call coming through. I'll just change this over. Um, okay, um, we're using Skype tonight and hopefully we've got Materia Toure coming through. Are you there, Materia? I'll just... Hello, can you hear us, Materia? Can you hear me? We can indeed. Yes. Oh, good. How okay. are you going? We're going well. So tell us, um, Greens, 10%, um, it's likely, likely to go up, isn't it, at this stage? Yes, I think it is. We do seem to be trending upwards, and uh, I think most of the booths where we do the best and the, most of the areas where we do the best haven't yet been counted. So it's looking very positive for us. It seems we've definitely cracked the 10% barrier that we were hoping to do. Yeah, uh, because at the moment the booths that have been counted are probably more rural booths. So we'd assume that the Greens don't do so well in those rural areas. Is that the case? Yes. Yeah, that's right. So our, our best booths are uh, the, the inner city ones where there's a university, funnily yeah. enough, mm -hmm. um, and they get better um, in the cities in general and in, in the major towns. So we, it, it takes a little while for our votes to always come through. And then, of course, we've got the special where we do quite well as well. Absolutely. So that's this does seem to be showing that the poll results are hold the, the sorry the uh, opinion polls leading into tonight, which did have you you know anywhere up to 13, 14 percent, do seem reasonably accurate. It's always been the problem for the Greens in the past that the poll results haven't then been matched in your votes. What's changed this time? Do you think? I think um, votes do tend to soften for most of us during um, on the day, but I think for the Greens this time we've had a very different polling history than at other elections. We got very high at more than 10, at around 10%, and we've been on that for quite a few months now. So it's not so much uh, we haven't had the same polling history, and also we peaked at 13.4 just two days before the election. Often we peak two weeks before the election. So I think that base that we've built has been very solid and has stayed that way through the whole campaign. Um, you know, people yep. feel safe voting for us and, you know, we're a proven political force now. Okay. You must be, you, I mean, maybe you're not. We're a bit surprised by New Zealand First doing so well tonight. Um, what do you think that means? Yeah. What do you think that means for the Greens? Have they stolen some of your vote? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that they've taken. I don't know where their votes come from. I was very surprised about this. Um, they have had a really good media run in the last two weeks, which always helps. It helps to build profile and encourages support. 
uh, they were sort of the underdogs and New Zealanders love underdogs yeah. um, so you know I, I'm, I'm sort of I'm a bit surprised it's so high I thought they'd get much closer to a 5% and just over so um, we'll see how it pans out but it's looking quite strong for them I'm surprised about it too. You said uh, you thought one of the reasons the Green Vault has held up so well is that you're seen as being a, um, a, a don't want to I want to get the word right. I believe you said a safe option, a you know good yeah. pair of hands this time. Yeah. The the campaign was obviously designed to build that image in the public's mind. Would you agree that that was true? That was something you wanted the public to be thinking going into the polling booth. Uh, yes, actually, that we were clear about. People last election, people told us two things. They didn't know what our priorities were for action, and they didn't. They weren't sure that we were ready to exercise real political power. That is to make the compromises that you need to make in order to get things done. So, with our memorandum of understanding with National, we showed that we could work across the political spectrum, which people didn't expect from us. And this election, we were very clear about our priorities for jobs and rivers and kids. So. We, we responded to what people said would make them feel more secure voting for us. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, we have, and we have secured their votes. Um, and so it's try, we, we're trying to be responsive. We haven't changed our policies, we haven't changed our principles, but we have been more responsive to what voters need from us. And that, that has made a real difference in this campaign. Under MMP, governments become a much more fluid, a much more... Uh, difficult to pin down concepts, so no longer do we have one party that just makes all the decisions. As you mentioned, the last parliament, the Greens did enter into this memorandum of understanding with National Party. Will that be something you're looking to do this time again? Yes, I expect so. And it looks like National will govern again, um, at least at this early stage. And if they are, in, if they are government or leader government, and we are able to find some common ground to work with them on some issues, then we will do that. That's what voters vote for us for. They want us to get stuff done. And we've shown that we can do that being out of government, because we've never been in government, even with Labour. So across the spectrum, we can do that. And this is, again, about us showing how to use political influence in a way that's very practical and is still very principled, and that we don't have to give away our principles or compromise too much on what we're doing, but we can find those practical solutions to those issues. So, you know, we. Material. Yeah? When are you expecting the phone call from John Key? <laughs> Do you think you'll, you'll hear something this weekend? Yeah, we, well, look, we'll, if, if we, we'll, no doubt we'll talk, have a brief conversation with him tonight and probably with Phil as well, I would have thought, and then we'll see how things go tomorrow. Until we know for sure what the numbers are, it seems a little bit fluid still, we just don't know what level of influence we're going to have. I mean, and so it's, cer um, certainly there's a, ch there's a chance, isn't there, huh? th there's a good chance, isn't there, that uh, National won't be able to form a, a government by themselves and um, uh, especially with an overhang, they might have trouble even with an ACT um, coalition partner and United Future, so New Zealand First is going to be quite important, aren't they? Well, they are. It depends on what happens with Māori Party, of course. Yeah. So if they keep their... It looks like they are might lose Te Tai Tonga. Yeah. Um, so it looks like they might be down one. Um, I just haven't seen the most latest results. So, yeah, they... they the Māori Party have said they will back National first. Um, so, you know, National has some certainty, at least with them. And we've just yet to see how those other numbers play out. But, you know, who knows at the moment? I still feel like it's a very open game. Yeah. So what's the, exactly how government formation is going to occur and how necessary the Greens will be in that relationship. You know, it's a, yeah. <laughs> on, on the, we'll yeah. On the other election that we've been having today, the, the referendum, uh, it looks like MMP is comfortably ahead on the advance votes. You, you feel that's going to carry through? Yeah, I do actually. I think the, the, the campaign for change really didn't fly. I mean, it just there wasn't really any kind of reasonable campaign, and the advertising was very odd. I found it very confusing as to what it actually, what they were actually trying to say we should do. So, um, I don't think it was ever a really good campaign. Um, and the the pro SM people really never got that message across, except via Don Key. And so I don't, I don't think it was um, it was a go. The campaign for MMP was much more organised, much clearer, um, even with fewer resources. So I think they did a great job.
So overall, tell us where you're at at the moment. You're, you're obviously not in Dunedin. You're up in Auckland, I believe. You're with your, your party volunteers, are you, at some function? Give us a picture. Uh, actually, I'm um, at, a, at my a family home here in Auckland, and I'm just getting organised to go over to the party a bit later on. Kind of wanted to watch the results come in and have some sense of what, what you know, how far, how close we've gotten to our target if we'd exceeded it um, before we go. So we'll be over at the party in a, about an hour or so. It's going to be something up to Materia, what is your target for tonight then? Uh, well, our target for this campaign was to breach 10%. And it looks like we have made that. Anything over that is an absolute bonus. And I'm, I think, I think we'll, we will get over 10%. Um, but it was 10% was the target, and we've done it. The Greens to get 13.5%. I think I'm probably going to be... Uh, I think it will be lower than that in the end, looking at things at the moment. But I, I think it will rise still throughout mm. the night. Mm. Um, but I'd say we're looking at 12% at least. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I'm, hoping for, I'm hoping for 11, 11 or 12. I think that would be a really good result for us. Now you know that the results are swinging your way, you know that you can put your happy face on and you know, go out there with a, a cheerful grin. Um, so we'll wish, we'll wish you the best of luck for the rest of the evening and uh, just enjoy yourself. You've run a good campaign, it's gone well for you. Yes, a very good campaign. Well, thank you. Thank you for being very good. Okay. See you later on. Yeah. Okay, cheers. Yeah, kakiri. Well, okay, so that was a, certainly a different tone of interview, I think from what we heard with Grant Robertson. That's right, a bit more optimistic perhaps, um, a bit more pleased with the way things are going. Well, um, I, th I think they're a party that's, as they said, they had their you know, breach 10%, they can yep. be pretty confident they're going to have done that, so they've got what they wanted. And the, pre the, the pressure isn't on. To some extent it doesn't matter for them whether they get 8% or 12%, the more the better, sure. but there's no sort of crucial point they need to get to. I think 10% yeah. yeah. probably is a reasonable um, target. Well, it, it's but very much a different feeling this election to past elections where it's been, will they get the 5%? Yeah, that's you know, right. Will they even be there? So survival wasn't exactly. an, an issue, yeah. it's just how mm. successful they're going to be. Mm. And so this is their big election, sure. really. Yeah. Um, I mean, you asked an interesting question before about the relationship between Labour and the Greens, whether it's going to be always um, mm -hmm. uh, a zero-sum game. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm still thinking about that, and I, mm. I, I still think that the Greens are likely to be able to get a lot of middle New Zealand votes, sure. um, people to the, to the right, basically, of uh, Labour. Mm. So um, they're a centre party, I think, is the mm. future of the Greens, mm -hmm. and we're seeing this in this campaign in particular, with them de-emphasising some of their more leftist, radical stuff. Mm. Uh, well, do you agree, or do you think I'm overstating it? No, I, I think certainly that, well, of course, the Greens' mantra has always been neither yeah. right nor left, but yeah. green. So That's they've right. always claimed to transcend these issues, though in reality we know that their support base always has come to the, uh, to the left of the... Uh, to the left of the, the yeah. spectrum. Uh, certainly, I think there's a feeling within some of the Green Party and previous Green members that they have shifted quite towards the right. Yeah. Um, but the question is, you know, where do they build from here? Or can they build on from here? Uh, they're going to have a very, very strong... And What's also interesting is the people that they're bringing in off their list are predominantly sort of younger, um, they are from a very wide range of backgrounds. That's right. Um, they are people who are all new to the political process, so they're mm. new, fresh faces. Mm. Uh, that gives challenges mm. because, as we know, new, first, fresh faces can make mistakes. But mm. it's also it's something that's quite refreshing to see. Yeah, mm. and undoubtedly there will be some uh, new people coming in on the list for the Greens this time. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. In particular, we looked, we interviewed. Holly Walker earlier in the um, yes. campaign mm -hmm. and she's a, a graduate of the University of Otago from yes. the politics department, yep. um, editor of Critic. Mm -hmm. I think she's got a bright future, so to mm, speak, in quite. the Green Party. Could even be a leader, yeah. co-leader before long. She was a Rhodes Scholar. Rhodes nice. Scholar as well, Scholar. exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah. we've got so uh, there's a number of other people to look out for. Uh, James Shaw, mm -hmm. and at number 15. Um, well, if they can push that high, I mean, yeah. there's still a couple of seats off that. That's right. So there. Mm -hmm. I'll be interested tonight to see whether they manage to get him, him yeah. in at number 15, yeah. because it, likewise, I, I see him as being the future of the Greens. Mm. Um, mm. He's been standing in uh, Wellington Central, mm -hmm. and he comes from a business background, mm. and mm. he's probably the more mainstream mm. um, 
um, and very dynamic mm. sort of part of the party. The people they're pulling in, it makes it harder and harder to pigeonhole the Greens as being the sandal wearing, yeah. bearded, I, Morris dancing weirdos of yesteryear. Those days and are that's gone. Really, that's, yeah. Now, of course, there will be some within the Green movement who think that that's a cop out and a sellout, and that then is the next hurdle they have to overcome. You know, can they mainstream without losing the people who actually do all the work for them? Mm. That's right. Okay, we'll just look at what other results are coming in. We were looking at Epsom before. We'll just go back to that. And although at the moment John Banks is well ahead, um, and that's still that's uh, what we saw just a few months ago. Yeah, there's I'm no, just nothing more see, no, there's no recent? update. Oh, so but nonetheless, yeah. if, if you think back to 2008, oh, yeah. um, earlier in the night. Um, Likewise, uh, Rodney Hyde, who, the act who was the actor candidate back then, he did very well at the start as well. Mm. Um, well he, he lost have... votes, but he lost votes throughout the night because his advance votes were the you know the people that act had managed to get out there mm. and sure. give those advance votes. So I think we'll see John Banks, his margin, um, not necessarily evaporate, but reduce from what we're seeing at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, Ohario, let's find that. Um, I imagine that's quite close. Um, at the moment, we can see that Peter Dunn's only just ahead, 1,900 votes over Charles Trevall on 1,700 mm. votes. Yeah. So again, that could still change. That's right. That's still you know, very close to. That could go. That's one polling booth could change that completely. Absolutely. Um, something we haven't just flicking back to the national results for yeah. a second. One thing that we haven't really commented on. It's sort of gone under our radar just for the moment. Uh, is that we've got the uh, Conservative Party polling at 2.45%. Mm. Now, Conservative Party, it's not enough to get them into Parliament, obviously, they're under 5%, yeah. and they need to win Rodney in order to be able to get anyone in. Colin Craig, the, voter, the party leader, would need to win Rodney, and I don't think he's going to do that. That's 2.45%, then it's going to be wasted vote. Okay. Um, which, once again, can partly cancel out any overhang, because the more wasted vote that there is, that pumps exactly. up the share, party vote share of the other parties. Exactly. So you know, we're still not we're not still not out of seeing a, a, a national majority government here. I'd say. Okay. Now I, we've got two things coming up. Now we've got um, uh, Professor Jeffrey Craig, who's joining us soon to talk about um, leaders' debates and how the leaders have gone. But also, I'm expecting a call from Radio New Zealand. I'm not quite sure if it's um, here or. Um, it's for me. No, I'm going to. I'm going to take off. Uh, no, no, you're here. I think you're, you're going to talk to um, to Jeff Craig about the leaders' debates and. Um, it's for me. I, oh, is it? No, that's for you. Okay, I'm going to talk to Jeff. <laughs> okay, talk to you soon. Ah, uh, professional okay. as ever. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so joining us um, here in the, the comfortable seats, um, yeah. Jeffrey Craig, and welcome, Jeff. Thank you um, guys. Jeff's an expert on leaders, leaders' debates, political talk. So I just wanted uh, Jeff to um, come in and give us his observations and analysis on um, how those leaders' debates and what leaders did, who out of Goff and Key did the best. Sure. So sure. what do you think? Well, I thought, um, I mean, as always, the leaders' debates were very interesting. And, but overall, I think that uh, Phil Goff performed very well over a number of the debates, particularly given that there was you know, so much negative uh, comment about his leadership style prior to the start of the campaign. So, so was that unfair uh, in the first place, do you think? Or well, he's, think a seasoned, he you know, he's a seasoned politician. Yeah. He knows how to, uh, to perform. But um, you know, these are there are high stakes in the, in the debates. And I thought he did really well, apart from the press... Um, mm. uh, a debate that occurred in, in Christchurch, the but overall, the numbers, the yes, the money. exactly, um, exactly. And um, but overall, I think that it was kind of like another demonstration that for the leaders' debates, often they give the opposition leader an advantage because suddenly they're sharing the stage with the prime minister, so with the leader, footing. and so it equalises yeah. the leaders in a way. And and Goff, you know, I think performed very well. He was very positive. Um, he was very energetic, mm. um, and the Prime Minister, in contrast, I thought, um, at times, seemed um, almost disengaged. OK. Now, just while we're talking, we'll bring a third person into the, the call here. Um, we've got the editor of Critic, Joe Stockman, um, coming in on the conversation. Um, Joe is currently in Auckland, and um, can you hear me, Joe? 
Perhaps not. Um, Joe is using mobile technology from, I think, Jacinda Ardern's headquarters in Auckland to give us an update on what's happening. Um, and so what we can see here is, on the screen, is in Jacinda Ardern's headquarters, the Labour Party headquarters. It looks like there's a bit of a party going on. We can see you, Joe. Can you see us? No. Nope. And it's gone. Okay, back to talking about leaders. Right. Um, although that will be an interesting contest in Auckland Central. Uh, so, Goff, do you think he even won those leaders' debates? Um, well, I, I think he did. Although, I th I th one thing that I thought was interesting this time around was that there was quite a, in terms of if you look at the media reportage of the debates and public responses to the debates, there was quite a diversity of views yeah. about who performed well and, and who won, in yeah. quote unquote. Whereas in the last couple of election campaigns, that wasn't the case. If you think back to 2005, Don Brash was uniformly perceived to have, have not done well yeah. against Helen Clark. And similarly, in 2008, uh, against expectations, John Key was said to have won the debates against Helen Clark. Mm. So, but this time around, there was a lot more diversity of opinion about about who performed best in the, the debates. Okay, well, what about the last debate? Because I found that in some ways the most interesting one on TV and Z. What on Wednesday night, um, particularly in terms of the body language of of John Key. Yes. Um, what was going on there? Um, well, I, I, I think that um, you know he was he was trying to um, uh, I mean you know obviously Goff was trying to engage the prime minister and, yes, he, was. and, and um, he he very much refused to do that. So I think that um, um, uh, I, and again I come back to the diversity of views about that. I've, uh, some people have said that um, the the prime minister um, seemed unruffled. Um, in response to the the responses from from Goff, and mm. some people said it seemed made him seem almost arrogant that he wasn't yeah. responding to him. And I think, I think in those circumstances, um, you know, it's uh, it's important to respond to the people because it is an interpersonal interaction. Even though we at home are watching it and it's a mediated sort of situation, it's also very much interpersonal. Um, uh, uh, conversation yeah. and you have to be able to engage with the person who's interrogating you. But could it be that John Key as the incumbent, as the Prime Minister was trying to appear Prime Ministerial, this is all beneath me, this is... Exactly. I'm, I'm sure that that's what the intention was, um, but I think that he left himself open to perceptions that he was being aloof. <clears throat> okay. So Goff, I, I agree, he, he did well in the campaign. Um, do you think it was enough to actually retain his, uh, let's assume for a second he, um, he, Labour can't put together a coalition um, after tonight. Do you think he will stay in the leadership position? Has he done enough? I mean, we all presumed that he wouldn't be able to, but may maybe sure. there's some doubt about that now. Sure. Well, I mean, that remains to be seen. I mean, I think that one thing you can say is that he has campaigned very well, very solid campaigning. And, I th and, and in particular, you know, just listening and watching the debates. He's been very skillful at deploying particular kind of rhetorical devices, most notably the kind of what I would call um, an everyday life story. A lot of the time we heard him saying, yeah. I was just visiting so-and-so yeah. today, and I'm talking to so-and-so, you know, and I've been to this school. It's a wonderful school, yeah. and this is what they were telling me. And he's linking those opinions to the Labour Party policy right. position, and I think that that works. So, as long as it's not overdone, yeah. I think that that so, can be very successful. Is that a deliberate, skillful technique of leaders, or is it just natural? What's I, I think it's 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 very much you know part of the coaching that occurs these days in leaders' debates that they're being told to yeah. to you know perform in a particular way, to speak in a particular way, um, and to engage in those kinds of. Um, you know, uh, rhetorical moments. But, um, but for me, I think what's interesting about these uh, debates that we've seen in this election campaign, uh, I think it underlines the extent to which, you know, I mean, the debates get a lot of criticism for not being real debates. Yeah. And, you know, of course, there's a lot to those criticisms. But and I, I think that, that increasingly what the debates are doing is that they're serving a kind of agenda setting function that there's certain rhetorical moments like show me the money yeah. that come out of these debates that set the agenda for the news over the next few days. So the kind of debates are, are kind of focal points mm. in the campaign narrative. 
Um, you know, so that's that's their primary function. That, that but, these but what days. about what about the minor party leaders? Because they weren't in these debates. Um, did any of them shine, or were they kept out because of the fact they were kept out of debates with Key and Goff? Um, you know, did that make them less relevant? What do you sure. think? Sure. Well, I, th I think it was very disappointing that we didn't have, as we have had, in pr going back to 2005, a leaders' debate where um, the National and Labor <coughs> leaders were um, on stage with the, the other I agree. party leaders. Because, yeah. And particularly in this yeah. campaign, when we've got a referendum on MMP, yeah. um, you know, the beauty of th that debate in 2005 was that it showed the, the, the major party leaders acting yeah. in a positive way with those people who they might be in coalition with. And I think that that is a positive perception of politics. And it would yeah. be a nice balance against the kind of confrontational debates that we have when we have you know, national versus versus Labor. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right, and it's a bit of a shame that we have kind of uh, cemented in place now, basically, that there's the two-tier leaders' debates. Um, yeah. But okay, I j also yeah. I just wondered, um, we've, got, we've got the results coming in, um, national still above 50%, um, but of course this is early days and they count the, the rural booths first, so... Um, it's looking like um, National will do less well than they've done in the opinion polls. Um, do we spend too much um, time looking at the opinion polls, do you think? I mean, how relevant are these opinion polls? Because we've been led to believe that National will you know, be able to govern alone. Um, I think we're heading towards uh, National getting 48%, maybe not being able to govern alone. Um, sure, yeah. I mean, opinion polls, opinion polls are important. And it is the case that a, a well-conducted scientific public opinion poll can accurately measure public mm. opinion. And we've seen over a number of election campaigns, both here and in Australia and elsewhere, where the polls have accurately predicted the election outcomes. Yeah. So, you know, they, they obviously serve an important purpose in that sense. But I do think that um, uh, while there's a legitimate place for them, I think that we get too much... We're too poll-driven these days. Okay. And it has altered the balance between the horse race... Yeah. and the focus on the policies in the election campaign. So should we ban them? No, we shouldn't ban them. Regulate we, them more? Um, well, that's, this is the difficulty. This is the difficulty with the whole process, that, that it, it is increasingly difficult to, to regulate the, the, the process. That's right. 